Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, who is going to talk to us about his industrial journey to Amazon. And as a person in academia, I'm very excited to learn his experience in industry, where our engineering knowledge is being implemented and realized. So our speaker, Dr. Washington, um, is a vice president of software engineering at Amazon, and he has received BS, MS, and PhD degrees from Texas A&M University. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Washington. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, it's really uh, my pleasure to be here to talk to you about my journey to Amazon. Uh, and I plan to not fill the whole time because I want us to have plenty of time for dialogue and or questions at the end. Um, but what I'd like to do is take you through the 30 rough years of my journey to Amazon, which represented a walk through four different companies along the way. So let's get started. And um, I uh, will try to share my screen here. Uh, let's see, here we go. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Okay. So um, at a very high level, this, this is my journey. I, I left Texas A&M as a freshly minted uh, engineer with a PhD in nuclear engineering. Uh, in fact, that's how I know Bruce. Actually, Bruce and I know each other. Uh, Dr. Carroll and I met each other in high school. And we both went to Texas A&M and went different engineering paths, but both uh, got our PhDs in engineering. So I stayed at Texas A&M and finished my PhD in nuclear engineering there. And when you receive a PhD in nuclear engineering, you really only have two choices. Uh, you can go to the nuclear Navy or you can go to a national laboratory. And I chose the national laboratory path. Uh, I was always fascinated by, by uh, doing um, complex, hard things. And the national labs just had this amazing reputation for doing hard things. And so I'm gonna talk about that uh, next, but I wanted you to see the whole journey first. And the main message of this, of this slide, that this journey is that if you, if you take nothing away from my talk than this, uh, you should take away that a path or an, a, a career in industry and engineering is almost always highly nonlinear. And, my, and my, you know, my journey was probably more nonlinear than most, but you can see that I've basically done lots of different things that uh, after the first job really have nothing to do with nuclear engineering. Uh, but all of them have something to do with solving hard problems, making a difference to society, and learning new technology, and doing something that I think is fun and interesting. And so whether it was nuclear safety engineering for a national laboratory, or working on the world's fastest supercomputers, or uh, leading IT at Lockheed Martin, or building spacecraft, or working on automobiles, or, and now robots for Amazon, uh, you can see that it's a highly nonlinear journey. And I'm going to talk about each of these phases of my career, and then I'll end with a few words about what I'm doing at Amazon, uh, which I, you know, it's just a lot of fun, and I, 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 uh, I hope you'll you'll enjoy that. So let's get started on talking about what I did at Sandia. When I joined Sandia in the late '80s, it was in the wake of. Uh, of a couple of nuclear, pretty visible and terrible nuclear safety incidents that had happened in the world. TMI happened in the late 70s, and then you had Chernobyl happen in the early 80s. Uh, and so the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was on high alert. And so they went to the national labs and said, okay, we need you guys, you big brain people at the national lab to help us. I, and we need to do some analysis. We need mechanistic phenomenological models to help us understand what would happen in the event of a severe nuclear reactor accident? And how do we pre prevent these by understanding the trades and the decisions that we might make in mod and controlling and, and mitigating uh, an accident if it were to happen in a, in a nuclear plant? And it wasn't totally theoretical because this was again in the wake of, of two really bad accidents that had already happened. And so I was hired by the team that was chartered with building 
a detailed phenomenological model for the phenomena that happened in a containment building if the, if the uh, core had melted down. And, and what you need to understand is the TMI was right at the edge of almost getting to that point. And of course, Chernobyl got to that point. And so, so we were working on models for concrete molten nuclear material interactions for aerosol phenomenology. My first job was to, was to model uh, the contribution of outgassing from concrete when it came in contact with molten core material. So I had to actually model the 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 uh, the phenomena that happened in the in the interface between molten metal and uh, concrete, model the the movement of gases through the concrete layers, and then uh, interface to the atmospheric um, thermohydraulic models in the in the rest of the computer code. It was a ton of fun. It was hard. Uh, I met a lot of really smart people. Um, but I knew it was not something that I could build a whole career around. And, um, and I circled the fate of Contain, that, the name of the code that happened in the mid 1990s, it was terminated. And I could see that writing on the wall. I could, I could just tell it was gonna be terminated. And the reason was uh, the world was moving in a direction of doing codes and models based on par parametric techniques. And this competing code that the lab was also building called Melcor uh, was being used increasingly more and more as, instead of contained because it was easier, it ran faster, and it was good enough. It wasn't as detailed and phenomenological as contained, but it was good enough for answering the questions that the customer wanted to have answered. So, so transition one was seeing the, the the writing on the wall that contained was going to be canceled and then tooling myself as a professional to do the next thing. And so as I saw this signal about what was happening to, to modeling hard and complex things, it led me to believe that I needed to tool myself it, with developing software because software was what was like it was the secret sauce. And so I taught myself C++. And right around that same time, you know, uh, you know, some of you may be old enough to, to not laugh at this next statement, but right around that same time, the internet happened. <laughs> okay. And I was just like, wow, what is going on with this internet? It's an amazing thing. And so I dove in and I taught myself how to, how to, translate and understand and and use all the new technologies with the internet i you know i dove into the browsers i taught myself how to move files digitally across across the internet man, man that sounds ridiculous today i mean it's like what do you mean you taught yourself how to move files on the internet well back then that was like novel nobody was doing it and so uh, i was asked to lead a team at sandia to help the lab figure out how to get the most out of the internet and I actually had in my office uh, a Sun mini computer that had the only internet connection in the lab that connected my, compu my computer in my office in Albuquerque to a Cray supercomputer in California. And that connection was running at 56 kilobits, which was like insanely fast at the time because everyone else was only doing dial up over the you know, 2,400 baud modems. But here's the point. The point was I made the career shift to, to learning internet technology and leading a team to shepherd that into customers. Uh, what this picture is on the left is a graphic that we, we drew for um, the textile industry. So the national labs were hired by the government to help the textile industry, which was really struggling in the, in the late 90s by bringing them modern technology. And that translated into equipping them with the internet. So one of my legacies is uh, I actually helped Walmart, Target, Russell Corporation, and a number of other corporations build the internet into their ordering systems. I got to meet the CIO at Walmart. I met the CIO at, at Russell Corporation. I met the CIO at several textile industries. And 
That sounds useless to you, but I can tell you at the time it was gold because it was part of, it was the beginning of my journey of building a set of relationships with professionals in the technology world. And, uh, and I learned a valuable lesson that, that relationships in the, in the technology world are worth their weight in gold. And in fact, that journey and that experience of leading that team that is depicted here in this graphic on the left, landed me my first dream job, which was the director of distributed computing at Sandia, California. So I moved to California and led the team that worked on high performance computing technologies and also IT technologies for the Sandia, California site. So a team of about a thousand people. Uh, my team was the technology and IT shop and the high performance computing uh, geeks of the, of the organization. Uh, and I was asked to lead uh, an effort to build a new world-class facility that became the lab where we learned how to really harness distributed computing. Um, so I, I succeeded in doing that. Uh, this is a graphic of the actual, this is a picture of the actual lab that was built. Um, and it was, went into, uh, went into service in the early 2000s. So uh, I, I really had a good, good time there, uh, learned a lot. Um, but what was important about that part of my, of my journey was that this was a step toward leading scientific teams. And I led the team that worked on models. In, this, in, in the first case, it was models for severe reactor accidents. In this case, it was models for nuclear weapons and nuclear weapon uh, safety and nuclear weapon phenomenology. And so our team was working with teams in Albuquerque using these distributed computing tools to do things that hadn't ever been done before, which was basically trying to understand the model, the phenomena of nuclear weapons without testing them. And so this was one of the national grand challenges at the time. It was called the ASCII program. And it stood for Advanced Scientific Computing Initiative. And it was the grand challenge of if you can't test nuclear weapons underground, how do you assure that they're safe? And so the way you assure that they're safe is you simulate nuclear weapon phenomenology on the computer. And to do that, you need some of the world's fastest computers. So the world's fastest computers were born at the time. And the computer race was on. This was the beginning of the high performance computing wars of the early 2000s. Started with a computer called ASCII Red, but soon we realized that these computers cost too much. And we had to figure out how to make these big, fast supercomputers with commodity technology. And so my team and the work that I did with my team was to develop architectures that could use commodity computers like PCs and network switches that were starting to show up in network centers instead of custom networks to build the next supercomputer. And our breakthrough was we forged a partnership with Dell and we ended up building the world's first supercluster. It was 60 teraflops and it was built in 2004. And I want you to take, just kind of take a look at this chart. The, the supercomputer war started in 97 with the world's first teraflop computer called ASCII Red. In 2004, we built the world's first supercluster and it ran at 60 teraflops. It was the fifth fastest computer in the world and we built it for under $20 million. Just to put that into context, all of these supercomputers up until that time cost over $200 million, and some were a billion dollars. So this was a breakthrough. And this breakthrough for building this supercomputer at, that ran at 60 teraflops was one of the fastest computers in the world. Uh, we got to celebrate that for you know, maybe a month, because soon after that, everyone else started building them at that, at that, using that same technology. And you can see from this chart, that from 99 to 2007, 
the speed of supercomputers using these kinds of technologies just went just went rampant. And so uh, it didn't take long before 60 teraflops felt like a really slow computer. Uh, but the point is that this was a phase of my career that I, that I was able to do something significant, left a legacy that I'm proud of, and I learned something that I hadn't learned before. But just like when I saw that Contain was about to be canceled, it didn't take long for me to see the signs that the world of building supercomputers to be in the HPC race was about to come to an end for me because you know the big guns of the world were taking over. IBM, Cray, Fujitsu, um, uh, Dell, you know, all of them took 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 over. And now, you know, the, the leaders in the field are people like NVIDIA. So I needed to take another transition. And that second transition took me to Lockheed Martin. And I want to tell you a story about this transition in my career that also I hope is helpful to you. Um, recall I said before the value of relationships in the technology field are worth their weight in gold. Well, this, this gentleman here, his name is Joe Cleveland. I met him, he was the CIO at Lockheed Martin at the time. I was the CIO at Sandia because I built the supercomputers and they had promoted me to CIO. Joe had invited the CIO of Sandia to his Lockheed Martin retreats every year because Lockheed owned the contract for Sandia. And every year the former CIO would always decline because they thought, well, why would I wanna to go to a Lockheed Martin retreat? When I became the CIO at Sandia, I started going and I met Joe and we went on his retreats, uh, Joe liked to sing, so he would do karaoke with his team. And so I you know, did karaoke with Joe. The bottom line is I built a relationship with him. And, and it became very clear that he wanted me to become his understudy. So he hired me to work on his team. And he told me privately when he hired me that, hey, Ken, look, I'm not gonna be a Lockheed too long. Um, and I, I want to just like bring you under my wing and be your sponsor. And this is the value of sponsorship and mentorship that, that really I've always, I've, I've never lost that lesson. And so I went to work with Joe. Um, he brought me under his wing and he taught me the ropes of what he was doing as CIO. But what I didn't expect was uh, literally months after I went to Lockheed Martin in 2007, Joe had a heart attack and he had one of these life epiphanies. And he said, look, I was gonna retire in like three, four years. And when you'd be ready to like take my job, but I'm leaving now because you know, life's too short. And so Joe retired in October of that year and it left me kind of dangling. And so here was another life lesson for me was sponsorship's important, but you need to have a backup plan. Okay, and I did not have a backup plan. But fortunately, I had built enough historical expertise and credibility and reputation that I was able to stay at Lockheed and take on a new job. But here was an example of where it was a job that I didn't want, but it was a job that I needed. And this was a job that Lockheed Martin needed me to do for them because they had an issue with data privacy. And they needed a privacy officer to wrap their hands around what had become just this big legal mess of how to secure data and how to meet a, a myriad of privacy laws where they had not had to deal with that complexity before. Well, I'm a nuclear engineer. I built supercomputers. I designed distributed networks. Um, you know, I run an IT shop. So. I didn't know anything about privacy, but I knew a lot about complexity and I knew a lot about building relationships and I knew how to learn. And so the first step in working my way through the morass of privacy complexity to help Lockheed Martin figure out how do they deal with this was to become a certified information privacy professional. So I took myself to class and I taught myself 
the ins and outs of the privacy profession. And I became a certified information privacy professional. That's what the upper left corner means, CIPP. It taught me about sensitive data, the meaning of opt-in and opt-out. It taught me what the, you know, the, the Children's Privacy Act was all about, COPPA. It taught me about HIPAA, the medical privacy information, how to do a data breach management plan, so on and so forth. So this was a, um, a real learning moment. It's a moment that taught me that you don't have to be the smartest kid in the room in order to do a hard job. You just have to humble yourself and learn and bring people onto your team that know a lot about it. So I built a privacy team. Uh, I learned enough to lead that team, to be a credible executive in charge of the privacy practice. And I put the, put the privacy program in place at Lockheed Martin. And I knew, again, that this was not something I needed to do forever. Uh, one of my mentors taught me a very important lesson uh, a long time ago, which was, um, you know, sometimes, you know, he would call it, sometimes you have to wash windows to get a view. And what he meant by that was, you know, do a job that you have to do in order to make, make a, a difference, but don't do it forever. Right, so do it to to open up opportunities to do something else that you really want to do. And so, in the case of the privacy program, uh, this gave me access to every executive at Lockheed Martin because every executive at Lockheed Martin had a privacy problem. And so, I had to go to each one of their staff meetings and brief them on what they needed to do to solve their privacy problem. And so I met the executive vice president of Lockheed Aeronautics. I met the executive vice president for Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company. I met the executive, the chief executive for Lockheed Martin um, Missiles and Fire Control. Um, and, uh, and it was an opportunity for me to not just meet them, but to learn what are they doing and impress them with my background and experience and my communication skills. Um, and it paid off. The Lockheed Martin Space Systems Executive was looking for a new lead for her advanced technology center. Uh, it's called their Technology Crucible. It was based in Palo Alto, California. Uh, this center is the group that's responsible for building first of a kind payloads for government customers, as well as uh, supporting their satellite uh, civil space and uh, military space uh, missions. So uh, I interviewed for the job and I landed it. Uh, and I landed that job because she needed somebody that knew something about high performance computing. She needed somebody that knew something about advanced materials and, and nuclear science. She knew, needed somebody that knew something about um, IT and cybersecurity and privacy because they worked on cybersecurity missions. Uh, their satellites were a key part of the cyber command for the defense uh, agency. So, I mean, I checked a lot of boxes for her. And, and so just kind of rewind and just like remind, remind yourself of that journey that I had taken up until this point. You know, I had gone through a, a term of doing privacy work. Well, that helped land this job. I worked in high performance computing at, at Sandia, California. That helped land this job. I was a nuclear practicing nuclear engineer for the for the Sandia labs. That helped land this job. So so all of these experiences filled my toolkit that equipped me for doing what became my second dream job the working for the Lockheed Martin Advanced Technology Center. Um, one of the things I'm really super proud of was this was the group that built the alignment camera and the primary science instrument that goes on the James Webb Space Telescope that was recently launched. So that was one of our claims to fame. Uh, we also did modeling and simulation for the for the missiles program uh, for the Defa Department of Defense. We built solar ob observation satellites for um, the NASA heliophysics division. So it was a group that just did all kinds of really cool technology 
Uh, I learned a ton. I didn't know anything about space systems when I got there, but I knew a lot about computing. I knew a lot about advanced materials and I knew some, some things about optics, but not much. And I learned a lot about it. Uh, and I uh, learned a lot about how they worked on, uh, on their, um, uh, in their laboratory environments to, to do all these hard uh, first of a kind uh, missions. One of the things that this group did that I'm so glad I spent the time to really take the time to watch, learn, and observe was something that they call their, their, um, uh, their uh, distributed missions group. And it, this is a group that worked on, on um, the control systems for satellites. And the control systems for satellites uh, involved six degree of freedom control systems. And so they had these, these robots in a lab simulating satellites that needed to be controlled in six degrees of freedom. And so they had simulated six off robots on this basic, this is like an air, like an air hockey platform. Uh, and uh, the team would develop the the uh, controls for those robots and tested it on the robots before they deployed it on the satellite. So it was a way to test and prove out the control models before in, in a simulated lab environment before you put it on an expensive satellite. Turns out that's that's that was that was an experience that that served me well in learning and you know, a lot of the language and the methods and techniques. That, that, that I used when I left Lockheed Martin and went to Ford as I led the team that was working on building a self-driving car. And so again, just like learning little things in one industry gets translated to applications in another industry. The, um, uh, the control systems on satellites use a mix of radar and LIDAR. Um, we had satellites that used LIDAR for doing interesting observation techniques. Turns out that was useful to me in the future because self-driving cars use LIDAR. So anyway, you get the point. There are, there are a lot of translatable mechanisms that I learned at Lockheed Martin Advanced Technology Center that got applied when I went to Ford. So why would I ever leave a job like this, um, when uh, you know, it's it was just a ton of fun, um, and the only reason I left this job was because I had the opportunity to do even a more more fun job. So Ford Motor Company um, came knocking and asked me to apply for the job of uh, the chief technology officer. Actually, it wasn't called the chief technology officer at the time, and that's an important that's an important nuance uh, of my journey. It was to lead their research and advanced engineering organization. So they asked me to come be the vice president of research and advanced engineering. So I applied for the job and I got it. And again, just like for the space job, I checked a lot of the boxes for them. They were looking for somebody that worked on, that led a large complex team, check, ATC. They were looking for someone that knew something about control systems because they're gonna build an autonomous car. Well, I just told you the story about our control systems and I was able to convey that to them. Uh, they were looking for someone that knew something about computing and simulation, check, from the Department of Energy's supercomputing days. And they were looking for someone that had a rich understanding of IT and, and technologies around computing. So, so I checked a lot of boxes for them. Uh, and so I was able to land that job and went to, went to Ford at a time when the auto industry was just at the crossroads of massive change. So the auto industry in 2000, I joined in 2014. And in 2015, and I put this, this is a, a YouTube link that you're welcome to, to watch later. Just, just Google. Ken Washington Techonomy, and you'll see it, you'll find it. I'm not gonna play it now. Um, but this, 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 and I, and I did this talk 
basically on the fact that the auto industry is going through a massive transition where mobility, the act of being mobile is going to be fundamentally different in the future than it was in the past. In the past, people bought cars, drove them for 10 years, sold them and then bought another. And the only time they interacted with the automaker like Ford was when they were buying the car or when the car broke and you had to take it to a dealer. And the times it would go to the dealer and it broke were times when you had a bad experience with the auto company. In fact, you might even argue when you buy your car, it's not a great experience with the auto company. And so auto companies had no real relationship with customers. Well, that was gonna all change. And I saw this, I could see it because all the signals were there. So it was my job to teach Ford that, that we had to change from being a company that made cars, that sold cars to people once every seven to 10 years to a company that had an enduring relationship with their customers because cars are got, were going to be connected. They're going to be connected all the time to the internet. They were going to be semi-autonomous initially and then later they're gonna be fully autonomous. And, and people are going to interact with their cars like they interact with their cell phones in the future. I could just see this. Tesla had already started doing it. And so the signals were all there. So I pushed forward to be the first auto company to start testing autonomous vehicles in a simulated environment. I just was tearing a page out of my history of simulating satellites in a simula simulated environment, as well as doing nuclear weapons simulation on the computer. I knew that we could do autonomous testing in a simulated environment and learn faster. So that was one of the one of my claims to fame. Um, I wanted to put this chart in here, you know, not to toot my own horn, but to leave an important message with you about what it's like to be an industry. The people you surround yourself met with matter in industry because they will dictate the impact and influence you have as well as the doors that can open for you. This man in the bottom right-hand corner uh, became my uh, boss. He, that's Jim Hackett. He was the CEO of Ford Motor Company. He became the CEO in 2017. Jim called me the day after he became CEO and said, Ken, you've been the vice president of research and advanced engineering, but what I really want you to do is to be our chief technology officer. And I want you on my senior team. And the reason he said that was, he said, because you've got the vision and you've demonstrated that you've got the ability to translate that vision of changing how we operate as a company and changing the nature of, of how, how we interact with our customers. And you can't do that from the bowels of your laboratory. You have to do that from the hallways of the executive team. So he put me on his senior most executive team. This is a, this is a picture from the 2018 Ford annual, uh, annual plan, annual report, excuse me. And he put me on his executive team. And my first job was to build relationships with all these people on the screen because I couldn't change the company by myself. These people needed to help, they needed to drive the change of the company. People that like, like Hao Tai Tang who ran the product development organization, he was probably the most powerful person in the company. All designs of cars and the engineering in bumper to bumper of cars went through his shop. Uh, people like Marcy Cleaborn, who was the CIO of the, of the laboratory and Joe, Joe uh, uh, Hendricks, who ran global operations. I had to really nurture relationships with these people. And, uh, and I'm sure you noticed the guy standing to the left of Jim in this picture, Jim Farley, who is now the CEO of Ford Motor Company. He was running global markets at the time. And so I built a relationship with him as well. So these relationships allowed me to have an impact in the company. And this is my last Ford slide. Uh, my team and some work I did at, at, at Ford included accelerating our work on electric vehicles um, 
and culminating with the building of the electric F-150, uh, you know, we, we designed the, the architecture for wiring up the vehicle differently so that you could fit enough batteries to have three to 400 miles of range in a truck while also having excellent torque and excellent handling. And, and you know, I love, I love this uh, quote uh, when uh, President Biden came to visit, we gave him a ride in a, in a prototype F-150. This vehicle he's riding in was actually not the production F-150. This is a prototype that was built in my lab. Uh, but we, we let him ride it, drive it, drive it and, uh, and it led him to just really have the conviction that, you know, we can win this competition for electric vehicles. So I was really excited about that. Um, we did a lot of work in the electric, on the electric vehicle front, but we also did a lot of work on the robotic front. And it was also my vision that Ford should be part of the robotics revolution because it wasn't just about autonomy in the cars. It was about autonomy all around the cars. We, could, we were building cars with robots in our factories, but autonomous cars needed to be assisted by other, uh, other, other robotic technology in order for humans to really get the value out of autonomy. Imagine package delivery, for example, and you need to have some kind of a robotic delivery from the vehicle to your door. So we brought robots to do prototyping and testing with, with delivery of items from the car to the door. Uh, and I could just see that this whole robotics revolution was really happening around us in a way that was going to change the nature of mobility, just like I saw back in 2014. So the revolution that started, and I wanted us to just accelerate it. And the best way to do that was to partner with our closest university, which is University of Michigan. We made an investment in what's called now the Ford Motor Company Robotics Building. And this is a picture of it. And in that building, the University of Michigan sits side by side with about 100 people from Ford Motor Company from the research group that I used to run doing innovation and advanced robotics. Well, that led me to realizing, excuse me, that led me to realizing that robotics was a big deal. And while I was enjoying the work at Ford, I felt like I had done what I came to Ford to do which was to help Ford see the revolution of the future of mobility. I accelerated the electric vehicle revolution at the company. We had successfully transitioned the autonomous vehicle program to Argo and they were off and running. We had the relationship with Michigan and we got their Ford Robotics building off the ground. We had new electrical architectures in our vehicles. So I felt like I had done what I went to Ford to do. And Jim Hackett had just retired. And I thought, this is a good time for me to make a transition. And so when, when Amazon um, came talking to me about leading their team to do a robot, I jumped at it. And you know, I, I share this just because I thought it was kind of funny. But it's not funny. And I, I, it's, I wanted to share this because I want you to understand that in industry, we are in a battle for talent, not just at the executive level, at every level. And so it's really hard for us to bring the right talent to industry uh, and to keep it. And the same, that's true at Ford, that's true at Lockheed, and that's true at Amazon. Uh, and so when an executive leaves one company and goes to another, it's a fairly big deal. It's a fairly big deal. Um, but I felt like I needed to do this, and I went to Amazon to lead a project called Astro. And Astro is a robot like no other. It's a home robot like no other. Um, but the robotics community has been trying to do robots like Astro forever, and they've never succeeded. Uh, it's a home robot that can autonomously map your home. It can remotely monitor your home when you're not there. It has a personality. Um, it autonomously navigates around 
fixed and static, static and dynamic objects. So it's really quite remarkable. They gave me a little glimpse of this and I was like, okay, I've seen enough. This is the team I want to lead. And so I joined in uh, August of last year. And shortly after that, you know, the team had already done the bulk of the hard work to bring Astro to market. So I've been working with the team on, on uh, what's next, taking Astro to the next level, building on Astro. This is our first robot. It's not going to be our last. So um, a lot of that I can't talk about, but I can talk a little bit about Astro and some of the, some of the science behind it to give you some sense of where we might, where, where we might be going next. Um, and then I'll stop and open it up for any questions. Um, so uh, Astro can check on your home because it's got a periscope and it's got a, a, a camera on top that can be remotely controlled from your cell phone. Uh, it can help you look out for your loved ones because when you're not home, you can be interacting with your loved ones through Astro and use the app to dynamically move Astro around and, and check on things. It can provide you peace of mind. There's an integration with Ring. So that if you have a Ring doorbell or Ring cameras, uh, Astro and Ring can work together to give you that peace of mind. The, the screen on Astro is a, is a fully functional Alexa device. And so it can follow you around the home and take Alexa to where you are. Uh, it has an advanced safety system, as I said. It you know it won't bump into things. It won't fall downstairs. You know it's 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 been built with safety in mind. It does processing on device. So again, the privacy experience that I, I had in the bat in the past has come in very useful here in terms of ensuring that the team is address, addressing all privacy issues associated with having a robot camera in your house. Uh, including managing out-of-bound zones and things like that. So it's a pretty exciting product. I want to end by uh, playing this video. Um, this video shows a few people that are on my team, as well as folks that led the team before I joined. And because uh, they were involved in building and bringing the Astro to life, I wanted them to, to give you some sense of the science behind Astro and their words. So I'm going to play this. And hopefully it works, and then I will stop after this. So it's only like three minutes long. This type of product didn't exist. It was an unrealized vision for many years. I was really excited to be able to work on something that was so complex and so sort of new within Amazon as well as New World. It's taking science fiction and making it a reality. Yeah, one of the senior management meetings we talked about, does anybody in the room think that in five, ten years you're not going to have robots in your home? And I think, like, yeah, we are. We said, well, let's get started. So that's when we really started to get into a lot of the fun experiences around sort of inventing um, what the customer experience should be for a feature that was just a line on a piece of paper prior to that. We've pulled together technologies from all these different areas to build something that so many roboticists have been dreaming about or thinking about. The question wasn't, should we build it, but why wouldn't we? No, Astro can see, infer, hear, understand, but then you add mobility on top of it. Astro is a robot that can go up to a meter per second. It has to detect walls. It has to detect challenging situations. This is going to be an autonomous device that's driving around your home. We had to make sure that there was a system that was always looking out and can stop Astro at a moment's notice. SLAN is simultaneous localization and mapping. This is a standard term used in robotics. It's an old problem. It's not a new problem. The complexity is immense. It's well known in the SLAM community that people will sort of say, we solved the math 20 years ago. We still haven't figured out how to do it. And this is a great example of how you've actually taken the math and delivered a truly impressive system. The robot has these cameras, and it'll look around, and it'll find points. And it's able to see if it recognizes where it is in this cloud of points in space. Astro is doing millions and millions of calculations every second. We have multiple neural networks running in parallel based on camera input. We have multiple planners in this thing, figuring out what to do and how to tie it all together. And kind of the neat thing about it is it's all packaged up within one robot. 
Astro goes flying in really well to be able to do it locally, do it so fast, map out the, the world so quickly. I'm, I'm really impressed. Now getting autonomously and, um, you know, the Mega Map of its own, I mean, that is incredible. We took inspiration from science fiction and movies and cartoons, places where people have looked into the future and thought about what could it look like to have something in the home to help you. We wanted to create a personality. Out of the top 100 robots that people love, only five of them didn't have eyes. It's effectively this universal symbol for communication. And we were able to communicate a lot of things that we otherwise wouldn't necessarily have been able to. Also, we got to really think about, you know, what should a robot sound like? Phonemes and motifs and, you know, creating chords. Most consumer electronic devices are just nuts and bolts. You turn it on, it plays a sound, that's it. Astro comes to life. This is our first robot, not our last robot. I, I think I'm excited to be able to launch Astro and share this with my friends and family and point to Astro and say, this is what it worked on. It's unlike anything I've ever done before. And the technology that we have built, I look at as foundational. Oh, Astro is a huge step forward. The next question will be, when should I get one? Okay, well, um, I hope you enjoyed that. You guys now know more about me than most people do, <laughs> but it, it was fun to take you on my journey and I'm happy to answer any questions for, I think we have like 10 minutes. Thank you so much for the amazing talk. Um, and um, I already see many questions in the chat. Maybe I can read out loud for you, Ken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. Go yeah, ahead. So the, yeah, the first question is, how many engineers are working on Astro? Well, we don't uh, divulge details of our team, but it's, it's several hundred, I'll just say that. It's, yeah. yeah, and the second question is, what advice would you give to college students planning out their careers? Well, um, so I guess the theme of my talk is, uh, don't plan the endpoint too with too much precision because there's no way you be able to predict that endpoint. I mean, I mean, could, as I came out of school, as I was preparing for my career at Texas A and I mean, how would I have ever said I'm preparing to go lead a robot team? And I mean, robot teams didn't exist, right? And uh, the autonomous vehicle teams didn't exist. So, so plan around the fundamentals and the principles that motivate you. And so. Just get clear, really clear, get crystal clear on what's important to you. So for me, I had three things that were important to me, and I was really crystal clear about that. The first was I have to work on something that matters for society. I want to make a difference. The second was I wanted to do things that were technically hard. And the third was I want to always be in learn mode. I want to learn new things. And that third one meant I wouldn't stay at one place for, you know, a long time because I want to learn new things. So, so I had those as my principles and that led me to, to do the steps that I just shared with you. So get, get your principles down and, but don't, don't plan too much precision around a particular job. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, what was your most challenging project and what was the most important thing you learned from it? Um, I think the most challenging project was the Ford Autonomous Vehicle Program. Um, I mean, it, it, I think it's fair to say that building an autonomous vehicle is probably the world's hardest problem right now. It's, it's just wickedly hard. And, and as much hype that's gone into autonomous vehicles and as much money that's gone into it, no one has still done it. Okay. At, it's still an unsolved problem. Uh, it's just a wickedly hard problem. And what I learned from, from that problem was, was that um, I learned to, to pivot from solving what you thought was the original problem to solving what matters for humans. And let me explain. So we started by saying, well, we want to build a, a robot car. We want to build a vehicle where you don't have to drive. So you can replace the human. And when we realized how hard that was and how many edge cases you have and what the long tail of safety looked like, 
on top of the fact that you don't have regulations, you don't have insurance problem, there's just like a, it's a wickedly hard problem. Once we realized how many hard problems were still unsolved, and despite the billions that Waymo had put into it and the Uber put into it, and you know, the, no one solved the problem, right? You know, Waymo can drive in hot, sunny, dry climates for you know few people, but not the general problem. We had to pivot from replacing a human to helping humans. So, so we put more energy on advancing driver assist technology and more effort on building an autonomous vehicle that might work in a, in a subset of environments where humans could still be in the loop in a remote control center. And so pivot the problem to one that, that will help people as opposed to one that just solves the science problem. The science problem might be interesting, but after you spend a couple billion dollars, the interest starts to fail, fade. What you have to do is make a difference for society. And so that was a big learning. That was a learning moment for me. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, what was the most challenging transition for you? The, the challenge, challenge. transition. Oh, oh boy, all of them were hard. <laughs> so, I mean, all of them were, but I think the hardest one was the first. I, I mean, you know, the first one was, but it was the hardest. You know, going from Sandia to Lockheed, oh my gosh, that was so hard. I mean, what, what you have to know about Sandia is it's like nobody ever leaves, right? It's like, it's like a candy land for, for, for geeks. I mean, you know, when, you, when I was at Sandia, I was just, I was happy as a clam, you know, I was running their IT shop, you know, I was living in sunny Albuquerque and I didn't have to go pine for budget. I didn't have to do annual reports. I mean, you know, every year a truck would come up to Sandia and dump $3 billion at the front door and drive away. You know, every year it happens like clockwork, right? You know, so it was, I was comfortable. I mean, and people get comfortable there. And so, I was too comfortable and I didn't want to be that comfortable. But boy, it was hard. I mean, when I went to Lockheed, it was like, oh, I have to like validate and confirm my budget. And I have to, I have to like propose, do proposals. And I have to like get, you know, I have to do return on investment statements. And oh my gosh, you know, I have to do financial reports and, Whew, that was hard, right? You know, going from uh, the government's just gonna give me a bunch of money every year and I just get to have fun to actually have to do a deliverable and justify my budget, that's hard, right? So that was the hardest one, yeah. Yeah, um, because of the time limit, I think this can be the last question. So um, could you give some advice for students who have not decided their future engineering field? Yeah, I guess my advice to you would be to just try things. Because I mean, it's like, if you don't, if you haven't decided yet, get some data. So get some data by trying things. Uh, volunteer, um, take a couple of online courses on things that you know, you might want to see if you like it or not. Um, intern at a place to see if you like it. So just get some data as to what you might like and what you might not like. And then make your decisions based on data by trying things. Okay, um, although there are still a lot of questions, I think we have to end here. Um, and thank you again for um, sharing your valuable lessons with us and for the great talk. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, you're, you're very welcome.